Take a look around you. What are the objects you see? What do they say about you? What do they say about the time you live in? What do they say about the culture, or probably cultures plural, that might inform your identity? In my case, there's this Apple computer that I'm typing on while preparing this lecture. It was conceived in Silicon Valley, but made in China, and many of its working components were sourced from mineral-rich locations from around the world. For example, cobalt from the Congo. The computer's on my wooden desk. I'm not sure where that's from. To my right is a big pile of books, mainly art history, philosophy, and animal studies, each printed in different cities. Uh, to my left are two guitars, one a Martin made in Mexico, another a Fender made in California. I'm sitting on a chair and there's a sofa just nearby. There's also a lamp on a stool. And then of course there are the clothes I'm wearing and my glasses. These are all the objects in my room. And notice how they already say a lot about me. Notice how they already say a lot about the global economic present that we live in. It's crazy to think how many different parts in the world are in some way connected to this little room. And the same likely goes for your room or workspace. Honestly, a PhD could write a whole dissertation just by working with the objects in our rooms. What I'm describing here has a specific name, material culture. Material culture is the study of everyday objects. Anthropologists study material culture. So do archeologists. And of course, so do art historians. And these are often related fields. All the objects around us and in history are rich with information. As one scholar puts it, material culture includes, quote, quote, all past and present human-made and human-altered forms, such as skateboards, billboards, succotash, yurts, paintings, pyramids, tattoos, gardens, medieval armor, and divided highways. That's a lot of stuff. And notice how this includes images, some of which we call art and some of which we call visual culture, alongside all these different things that have been made by human hands. And this is important because in this session, we'll be looking at everyday objects and images of everyday objects in order to learn about past cultures. So what do we gain by taking a material culture approach to art history? Well, for one thing, learning to analyze the objects around us in a critical way can be very helpful, even urgent for us. For example, knowing how YouTube and its algorithms work is good to avoid falling down an informational rabbit's hole. Or another example, being aware of the environmental impact of what we consume or choose not to consume can really help the climate crisis. More simply, knowing how images and objects work on you, often by tapping into your desires or maybe even creating your desires, makes us more critical, aware, and attuned to the world around us. Also, if you think about it, working from a, a material culture perspective democratizes the objects in the world. If we only looked at canonical works of art, we'd likely get stuck in very rarefied and elite history. By including mundane, everyday objects in our study of art history, we can be concerned with the culture in much broader sense, and not just from the powerful classes. Working with objects also involves other senses beyond the visual, taste, smell, touch, and hearing. And lastly, using objects to interpret history in different cultures will help us in interpreting artworks, like paintings, often in novel ways because art is a subset of visual culture, which is a subset of material culture. Think of all this as a conceptual archeology span of everyday life. In the following lecture, we're gonna do four related things to material culture. First, we're gonna look at some objects from different places in the world. Then we'll look at objects that have appeared in famous paintings. Then we'll talk about visual culture as a mode of seeing oneself in images. And lastly, what might be the most important part, we're going to consider forms of everyday representation that had so long been stifled and not, not allowed to see the light of day. Okay, so let's start with some objects. We're going to start in, a, in the Neolithic period, specifically around 7,400 before the Common Era. This is about 9,000 years ago. This period is really consequential for human history. Although it happened at different times and in different places on the planet, this is when our species went from hunter-gatherers to settled agricultural communities. The implications for this are really mind-boggling. One of these is that we could simply have more stuff around us. I mean, think about it. If you're a hunter-gatherer who moves from place to place, 
you have to travel light. If instead you develop a community that stays put, cultivating the land, you can grow and make more things. This is when certain plants uh, and animals became domesticated under human control. It's also the moment when social hierarchies began to develop. Recent ar archaeological studies have argued that this is when social inequalities first developed in human societies. And so how do scholars study this period of human history that precedes any written record? Well, through, the, through material culture. You're seeing an archaeological site in Çatalhöyük in modern-day Turkey. This site has been excavated and new findings come out periodically. It was an early community of Neolithic peoples. They built houses that butted up against each other, which meant that there were no streets between the houses, but it also meant greater protection from outsiders. Here's a drawing of what one of these houses probably looked like. You'd enter from a ladder at the top on the roof. There'd be an oven and living area, and deceased family members would be buried beneath the house. Archaeologists have also found wall paintings, like this one. The vibe of this wall painting is very different from the Chauve Cave paintings we looked at for our first session. Here's an ancient breed of deer, which evidently was very large, uh, and he's being chased and maybe even teased. The human figure just below the animal's snout seems to be pulling on the tongue. What does this tell us about our Neolithic ancestors? Well, maybe that domestication had changed the way they thought about the animal world and nature in general. Maybe this kind of wall painting was an early form of comedy. I mean, they didn't have Netflix yet. I'm joking, obviously, but it's always fascinating to think what everyday life was like for communities that lived so long ago in the past. Here's one of my favorite examples from antiquity. This ceramic comes from the Minoan civilization, a predecessor to ancient Greek culture that formed on the island of Crete in the Mediterranean. This vessel would have been owned by an elite member of Minoan society. It would have been used to hold a precious liquid, maybe oil, and likely used during wealthy feasts. It's got this amazing octopus. Look how perfectly the eyes and tentacles fit the circular design of the flask. It also tells us something important about the Minoans. The sea and sea life was important to them. Crete is surrounded by, by water, after all. The painter of this pottery also included shells, sea urchins, and coral floating alongside the outstretched limbs of the octopus. Similar-looking pottery would be found throughout the Mediterranean, which also tells us that the Minoans were important economically over seafaring routes and had a big influence. With this statue, that I'm showing you next, we fast forward to the last phase of ancient Greece, what's known as the Hellenistic period. I think you can tell that the glory days of, ancient, of the ancient Greeks were in the past. We'll have plenty of chances to study Greek art in this class, which was almost, um, almost always preoccupied with ideal human beauty. Here, however, whoever this Hellenistic sculptor was, they give us an elderly woman who's clearly had a difficult life. She's on her way back from the market with vegetables and a chicken in the basket, and the bird will likely be sacrificed to the god Dionysus. She's from the lower classes, and in many ways her look and the meager object she carries gives this away. Around the same time, but almost 5,400 miles away, we have this amazing pipe from the indigenous Hopewell culture. This is centuries before they'll be so-called discovered by European explorers. Hopewell culture pro uh, prospered at the time, living on land equivalent to the U.S. states of Illinois and Ohio. What you're seeing is a beaver standing with its tail tucked between the legs in a defensive posture. It's made from a type of black soapstone. The teeth are actual beaver teeth, and they were firmly fixed to the sculpture, to the pipe, and the eyes are two freshwater pearls. It was found at a burial site, which tells you how important it was. European explorers took up the habit of smoking tobacco, a plant indigenous to the Americas, when they began trading and interacting with indigenous peoples. Europeans would turn this practice of smoking into a recreational thing, something just for daily pleasure. But this isn't how smoking was understood by Hopewell culture. It was a sacred activity that would only be done on specific and important occasions. The smoke coming from this pipe, emanating up into the air, would be a form of communing with the spiritual world. This means that the pipes themselves were sacred objects and that they would often be made from precious materials reserved only for pipe making. 
all these objects from different times and periods, a wall, a flask, a sculpture, and a pipe, give us quite a bit of information. Now, we can take this material culture perspective of being attentive to objects and transfer it to the analysis of canonical works of art. When we do this, we're treating the everyday objects seen in the paintings not only as clues to a culture and time period in the past, but often these objects also double as symbols. An object takes on symbolism when it means something other than what it is. And usually a symbol is conventional in that it's a meaning shared by a culture or society. The objects then give us access to a symbolic world that's not our own. Now, what are some of the symbols that have become second nature to us? I can think of a few. So for example, what's this symbol? Well, you probably, you probably got it. It's the recycling symbol. What about this one? Now, I'm sure almost everyone understands this symbol, uh, which now, I guess, has two meanings. It used to be uh, a symbol for number, but now, of course, it's the hashtag. And then what about this one? Yeah, sure, that's the peace sign. Though this isn't necessarily a universal symbol. None of these are. Uh, if you turn this the other way in the UK, it would actually be quite an insult. Nonetheless, all these symbols are second nature to us. But what would happen if we somehow brought someone uh, back from the dead in the 15th century Northern Europe? Would they have any clue what these three symbols mean? No, because our symbolic world is different from theirs. Our conventions have changed or have been updated. But let's not get a big head, because what if the tables were turned? What if we were sent back to the 15th century Northern Europe? Well, we'd better study up on that time period. And one way to do this is to understand the everyday objects that had symbolic values. Here's one of the most celebrated paintings from the 15th century in Northern Europe. This was painted in Flanders, modern day Belgium and Holland by Jan van Eyck in 1434. Van Eyck is one of the most important painters of the Western Renaissance. The Renaissance was a time period in Europe during the 1400s to the mid 1500s where artists, writers, philosophers, and politicians began looking back to ancient Greece in all sorts of ways. They envisioned themselves as rebirthing antiquity, which is literally what Renaissance means in French, rebirth. We'll talk about the Southern Re Renaissance in this class, especially in Italy, but this example comes from the Northern Re Renaissance, which was known for incredibly meticulous and naturalistic painting. Jan van Eyck was the most celebrated artist during this period. It was even once thought that he invented oil painting, though that turned out not to be true. Oil paints had been used well before this. Still, he was a master of oil paints. Before Van Eyck, most painters used water and egg-based painting, which is called tempera paint. Unlike tempera paint, which dries really fast, oil paint dries really slowly. So a painter could take their time, building up the image, image brushstroke by brushstroke, allowing, allowing the oil-based pigmentation to take on really deep and lustrous hues and qualities. And let's not forget, pigments, which give paints their colors, are made from various natural resources like precious minerals. These are also aspects of material culture. You're seeing all these visual features of oil paint here in the double portrait of Giovanni Arnolfini and his wife. It's usually just called the Arnolfini portrait. So who is this couple? One way to answer this question is to analyze all the objects owned by the man in the image. It would be him that owned everything. First of all, his clothes. He's wearing a big hat that was fashionable at the time and a large ermine fur. Along with his wife's elaborate dress and all the fabrics in their home, including the beautiful rug on the, on the wooden floor, you already know he was a wealthy person. In fact, Arnolfini was a banker who made his fortune in textiles. And this was a period in European history when wool became an important commodity. The oranges on the windowsill also speak to economic trade, as they could only be grown in southern Europe. And speaking of the wife's dress, it's often noted that she's wearing a white headdress, which denotes purity, and is holding large folds of the green fabric at her middle. Some art historians have argued that this means she's pregnant. This can be corroborated by the wooden figure at the far back just left of her head. Do you see the little broom and just above it what looks like the top of the bedpost casting a shadow on the wall? This is a figure of Saint Margaret, the patron saint of childbirth. The oranges on the windowsill also symbolize fertility and birth. 
It's the nature of fruits that they bear their own seed inside them, so they've always been potent symbols of fertility. Other art historians have argued that this is a double portrait commemorating their wedding. Here too, lots of objects corroborate this interpretation. The clogs on the ground at the front left and the red slippers towards the back are not just shoes. They also symbolize holy ground. In other words, the sacrament of marriage. The little dog, a Brussels griffin, who's just to the left of the wife, standing still and looking right at us, is also not just a dog. He represents faithfulness, as dogs still do today, which would make sense for a wedding portrait. Some scholars have even argued that this painting is the wedding contract itself. They note how just above the mirror in the back, Jan van Eyck has signed his name along with the words, was here, 1434. He also likely appears in the mirror along with his assistant. And so the artist is the witness not only to his own painting, but also to their marriage. Yet other art historians have argued that this portrait is a memorial. And in fact, we know that Arnolfini's first wife probably died in childbirth. For this interpretation, we look at a peculiar detail on the ceiling. Notice how the ornate chandelier only has one candle lit. The other candle holders are empty. Notice how the lit candle just above Arnolfini's head, uh, and, that, and notice how the lit candle is just above Ar Arnolfini's head, and that the one just over the head of the wife is empty. This has been read as signifying the fact that Arnolfini was alive and that his wife had passed away. Well, of all these interpretations, which one sounds the most compelling to you? We may never know exactly the story or reason behind this painting, but even so, by paying, by paying attention to the material culture around this couple, we already learn a lot. And there's even more to say. The objects and their placement speak to the ideas at the time, what in our first mention I explained to you as ideology those uncritical beliefs that any culture holds at any given time. Here we see gender roles visually, visually reinforced. Notice how Arnolfini is almost offering up his wife to the viewer, maybe showing her off, maybe even treating her like an object in certain respects. Notice how he looks confidently bored while she looks demure and a bit downwards. It looks a little bit like at his raised right hand. Notice how he's by the open door of the room as we can glean from the light source coming from outside the painting on the left, and she's visually bound by the bed. All this denotes male active activeness in civic life and female passiveness in domesticity. You'll notice she's even eye level with that broom in the back of the room painting, further reinforcing her domestic role. Another ideological component of this work is at the level of nature. After all, a fortune was made by turning natural fibers into commodities. Notice also the cognitive dissonance of Arnolfini wearing the skins of certain animals, minks, while taking care of another animal, the pet dog. This is called speciesism, where certain species are conventionally favored over others. So in fact, this painting reinforces the primacy of human power, economy, and culture over the natural world, which will eventually lead to the Industrial Revolution. It's really quite incredible all the information we've been able to gather just from Arnolfini's room. This next painting is also from Northern Europe, but from the Baroque period, which came after the Renaissance in Europe. It starts around 1600. Again, like the Renaissance, there's a Southern and a Northern Baroque. Here we have Vermeer, a Northern painter who lived in the Dutch Republic. Even during his time, Vermeer was admired as a painter of genre scenes. Genre paintings are scenes of everyday life. Almost all of Vermeer's paintings show you a room with the soft glowing light raking from a window at the left of the composition and figures performing everyday tasks. He didn't make that many paintings, so today these are some of the most cherished West Western paintings. His scenes are almost all perfectly still, quiet, and serene. For me, there's almost, they're, they're almost the visual equivalent of ambient music. Both sort of envelop you and bathe you in this slow, meditative way. What's also incredible about Vermeer's style is his brushwork. Everything is soft and gauzy. You can't really make out his brush strokes, making it seem as if the image simply appears before your eyes through light itself. This is the way photography works. And while photography won't be invented for another two centuries, it's thought that Vermeer used the camera obscura to achieve his level of realism of light in his paintings. Like Jan van Eyck's paintings and so many other artists from the Northern Europe, 
The objects in Vermeer's rooms take on symbolic meanings. In this painting, Woman Holding a Balance, we see a well-to-do woman with her pearls and other jewelry in front of her. She's holding an empty scale, probably calibrating them before weighing those gold, coils, uh, gold coins on the table. You might think then that this painting is just about domestic splendor in the Dutch Golden Age, but notice some other crucial objects in this genre scene. There's a mirror on the left wall, just by the window, which, if this woman were to look up from her scales, she would come face to face with herself. Just as important is the painting within the painting just behind her. And it's not just any painting. It's very clearly a last judgment scene, which references, which references the book of Revelations in the New Testament and shows the figure of Christ during the end of days, where the story goes, all souls will be judged. Often in these scenes, you'll see angels literally weighing the souls of both sinners and saints. So the mirror, which denotes self-reflection, and the last judgment painting, both find an echo in this woman's act of weighing her fineries. On the one hand, we're presented with luxurious and expensive objects. On the other, we have objects that remind the woman, and, implicit and implicitly us, the viewers, to remain pious in the face of herself and all her luxuries. It's as if she's about to weigh not her gold coins, but the two different worlds she inhabits, the mundane world of objects and the celestial world of divinity. And in such paintings, luxurious objects are always subservient to the divinity. If today we have jewelry ads that tell us diamonds are forever, this is not what this lady was thinking. She's thinking that her God is forever, and that her possessions are less important and fleeting. So once again, we have a painting of everyday objects that are deceptively rich in meaning and symbolism. Okay, so we've talked a lot about the significance of objects and what they can tell us. Now let's turn to that subset of, of material culture, specifically visual culture. You can think of visual culture as all the images you see in your day to day. The pictures and memes posted by your friends on social media, visual culture. Billie Eilish's new music video, video culture. News images from what's happening in Afghanistan, visual culture. The new FIFA 22 video game, visual culture. I think you get the point. Normally, these sort of images don't interact with so-called fine art. In art history, there's often been a distinction between high or elite culture and lower popular culture. Yet this began to change sometime in the mid-20th century in Europe and the U.S. with pop art. Pop artists are some of the first to include popular visual culture in their paintings, from comic books to advertising to magazine photos. One of the great pop artists was Andy Warhol. Warhol lived in New York City and called his studio The Factory. This already says something about the everyday in pop art. Warhol considered art to be like any other product that comes off an assembly line and store shelf. And the work you're seeing here demonstrates this. It's a repeated silkscreen image of Marilyn Monroe. Silkscreening is a printing technique that pushes ink or paint through a fine mesh or silk screen using a stencil to produce the design. The mass-produced image comes directly from one of her movies, in other words, popular visual culture. And Warhol was fascinated by celebrity culture. Have you ever heard the saying, everyone gets their 15 minutes of fame? That's Warhol. He was especially fond of Monroe. In fact, the actress had just died of a drug overdose, and so art historians often interpret this painting as a memorial of a social icon. And this makes a certain amount of sense, because once a celebrity passes away, all the images of them still remain as a sort of afterlife. Think today of deceased musicians and the controversies of using holograms of them in concerts. This is reinforced by the dual nature of Warhol's painting, which is actually a diptych. A diptych is a painting on two panels. On the right are the more realistic photographs of Monroe's face. They're in black and white, and seem to fade away, leaving only ghostly after images in the right-hand column. On the left side, however, her face is saturated with color and they all appear to be identical. They also seem to be permanent, maybe even immortal. Scholars have often compared Warhol's images Monroe, of Monroe to icon paintings of the Virgin Mary. It's as if these images, the mass reproduced photographs and films of the celebrity actress, live on in perpetuity even after the flesh and blood person has passed away. 
This might get to some of the reasons why it might be so hard to become famous. It must feel like the person you are in the media and in front of the cameras is not the same person you are when you're alone uh, with trusted family and friends. It might actually be pretty alienating and strange to be a celebrity. And it might very well explain why there's certain struggles with one's identity. What we're describing here has a name in philosophy. A simulacrum. A simulacrum is an image that doesn't correspond to anything in reality. It's an image that's completely divorced from the real world. Think of models being photoshopped to such a degree that their skin, faces, and bodies no longer relate to what they actually look like in real life. Or think of CGI, like all the Avenger movies, where most of what you're seeing is just code in a very popular computer. Or for a great sci-fi example, think of the Matrix movie. The spoiler alert. In the Matrix, what seems to be the normal everyday life reality of Neo, played by Keanu Reeves, is actually all a simulation in a computer. Theories of simulation were important in the 1970s and 80s, and it's often thought that pop art, especially Warhol, was already showing us that we were entering into a new age of simulacra and simulation. And in a way, I feel like today this, this is old hat. Part of being critical and aware of visual culture today is knowing that most of the images we encounter need to be taken with a grain of salt. We now have so many ways of altering reality through image manipulation. Just think of deep fakes. That is crucial for us to remain vigilant about the way images work on us. We even know that the visuals of social media literally get as high with dopamine releases in our brains, which we then keep searching for almost like an addiction. Some researchers have even argued that our nervous systems and our ability to concentrate have been hacked by our devices. This might very well be true. So again, this means that being attentive to material and visual culture is really important. But is Warhol's simulacral imagery really so new? Can we find a similar dynamic in other cultures further back in time? What if we revisited Japan and the floating world of the Edo period? Remember back to our first session, this was the time of pleasure districts that included brothels and popular entertainment like kabuki theater. Here we have another uh, okioi print, this time showing one of the most famous actors of the time, Otani Oni Oniji. Here he plays a villain in a play called The Colored Reigns of a Loving Wife. The artist, Toshu Sai Sharaku, perfectly captures the mannerisms and facial expressions and dress of the role. But a little like Warhol's Marilyn, the image is flat. He represents the essence of the actor in a stylized way. Does this image correspond with reality? Sure, a little bit, but it also creates its own effects and has its own style that's divorced from reality. So isn't this too simulacral? What's likely more interesting to talk about is to think about all the ways people in Edo, Japan identified with celebrity culture that they saw in such images. Would people mimic the actors, their gestures, and the way they dressed? Would they identify with the stories and the plays they enjoyed? Would they conceive themselves as actors of their own lives? And would they take on the, the ideas, beliefs, and worldviews of the entertainments that they consumed? It might be hard to say exactly, but I think it's safe to say that the answer to all these questions is yes, to some degree. Going back to Warhol for a moment, did men and women identify with Marilyn Monroe in the 50s and 60s? Absolutely. Do we identify with famous actors and athletes today? And now through social media, even just everyday people have become famous as so-called influencers. What about the films we watch and the music we listen to and even the brands we choose to buy or can afford to buy? For sure, so many of these points of consumption that come to us as images affect our self-conceptions. We see ourselves in the material and visual culture we gravitate towards. Or is it the other way around? Is it material, and, material culture and visual culture that shapes the way we see ourselves? Or is it maybe a little bit of both? This type of self-identification can be found in art history too. In fact, it's often the case that artists play the role of putting a mirror in front of society, usually select parts of society. Here's a wonderful example from the 18th century Rococo period in Europe. This was painted just two years after the death of King Louis XIV. His death kicks off the Rococo period, because just before then, this king, who was such an absolute monarch that they called him the Sun King, had control over all political, social, and cultural life in France. His tastes were what goes. After his reign, though, the aristocracy finally had room to express their own tastes and desires, which is what we find in Rococo art. 
these noble classes, especially like dancing, theater, sexuality, and expressing social manners. As a movement, it's often been dismissed as frivolous or too lighthearted and pleasure-seeking. Recently, though, scholars have begun to understand how important this change in politics and culture really were, and how we can trace our liberal societies and the ways our own identities are shaped by what we consume and how we express ourselves back to the Rococo. The term Rococo itself comes from the French word rocaille, which means pebble or rock work. This term gets at the ornate nature of the movement, and not only in painting and sculpture, but in interior design, furniture, and so much else. Watteau was one of the great painters of this period, and what you're seeing here is his pilgrimage to Scythera, which shows a group of upper-class aristocrats enjoying themselves on the mythical island of Scythera, where Venus was said to be born. Or are they on their way back to or from the island? This remains ambiguous. What we do know is that this wealthy group of people are having a great time. Little Puti, Puti are winged cupids, shoot up in the sky from their ornate boat, Everyone is wearing their finest outfits of silk and satin, and generally there's sexual intrigue throughout the painting. After all, Venus was, among other things, the goddess of love. There's a great deal of seduction here. Notice the group of figures on the right. A woman is looking towards the ground, maybe at a seed cupid who's tugging on her dress, while the man next to her is getting a bit close and seems to be gesturing into the woods. I think we can get the drift. In some ways, the Rococo is really like today's soap operas and all the relationship plots that go along with it. But what's important to note here is that this class of people saw themselves in Watteau's paintings. And actually, Watteau probably tailored his paintings to suit their desires so that his painting could be accepted by those in wealth and power. They even created a new category of painting so that this work could be accepted into the academy. The new genre was called Fête Galante, which means elegant party. Normally, a big painting like this that doesn't show a mythological scene or historical event in the past wouldn't have been accepted to the Academy. In short, Watto put a mirror up to this elite society and showed them at their best with all the material and visual culture that goes along with it. By the time we get to the 19th century in Europe, a new class of people begin to see themselves in paintings, the bourgeoisie and the upper middle class. Now it was not only noble people who had leisure to spend uh, and have fun, but other, sec other sectors of society too, at least on days off. It's really incredible to think that most of humanity, most of human history, didn't have very much le leisure time. Most time was spent working and subsisting. But with the emergence of free markets and industrialization, the idea of free time, even the idea of the weekend itself, became a thing. Here's probably Renoir's most famous painting, Moulin de la Galette, which shows a group of young upper middle class people dancing, drinking, and socializing. They too are wearing their finest clothes, and Renoir seems to relish painting all these fabrics, especially the satin sheen on the women's outfits, as well as the sun that streams through the canopy of trees in the courtyard of the café. A café is a bar in France. You can almost hear the chatter, glasses clinking, and music playing. Renoir was part of the 19th century Impressionist movement, which used very quick brushstrokes to give us a sense of time fleeting and the play of the elements both in urban and rural locations. They were also some of the first Western painters to paint everything on the spot outside. This was called en plein air, which simply means outdoors in French. And clearly they were very attentive to the material culture around them. In fact, Paris at this time in the late 19th century was becoming the city of lights that we know today, where people would browse the splashy shops along the big boulevards. Society became something of a spectacle, surface-level entertainment and consumption. The Impressionists sought to document and paint this social shift, which had a profound effect on how humans understood themselves and lived their lives, us included. Okay, so this is all fine and good, but there's a nagging question here, no? If visual culture is a reflection of society, and certain classes came to see, see themselves in this visual culture, uh, as, as is in the preceding examples, what about all the classes of people who were not represented? Who has been left out? There's a term for this that comes from post-colonial theory, the subaltern. It's a difficult theory to study and understand, but basically it goes like this. 
a group of Indian scholars began asking the question of who speaks for whom in history. They found that very often it was the elite, wealthy, and educated class who wrote and visualized the lower classes, if at all. This means that the historical archive is bent towards those types of writings and images. But then how do we know what poor, everyday people thought and how they conceived of their lives? How do we know about what they desired for themselves? How, in short, could they speak for themselves? This is a difficult question to answer. In some ways, being attentive to material culture, which, remember, ideally it democratizes all objects of study, from the low to the high, can tell us something about the peoples who have been left out of the historical record. But it's not just those who have been uh, left undocumented. It's, all those, it's also those who have been so long excluded. One of the big shifts currently underway in art history, and really in all the humanities, is the decolonization of the discipline. This can mean a number of things, but fundamentally it's an attempt to undo the Western biases and prejudices that have so long grounded art historical inquiry. This means going back and giving credit and attention to writers, artists, philosophers, and cultures that fell outside the Western tradition and were wrongly deemed, and were wrongly deemed inferior and not worthy of study. We're going to end this session by looking at two artists that fall into this category. This is a family portrait by the Malian photographer Sedu Keita. He grew up in Mali when it was still under French colonial rule. At one point, he was enlisted to be an official photographer for the colonial administration. This was when every colonial subject was forced to have a form of picture ID. So he set up a photo studio and over the course of his career photographed some 10,000 people. Normally, col colonial studios would have European backdrops, like a room from Victorian England. Keita instead used patterns specific to Africa. Here we have a family looking straight at us. Their attire is cosmopolitan, fabric specific to Mali with shoes and watches that point to European styles. These photographs were profound in reconceiving what it meant to be a person living under colonial rule. Above all, by showing a sense of pride, dignity, and self-identification. Still, a lot of the pho photographs were lost or simply thrown away. They weren't considered works of art just visual documentation, like a family album. It was only in the 1990s when a French, when a French curator quote-unquote discovered Keita and his negatives that these photographs would go on to be shown in museums all around the world. And finally, we have an example from the United States. This is a painting by Carrie James Marshall, who has long painted the black experience in his work, but has only recently gotten his critical due. He had a big retrospective at the Whitney Museum in 2016. He paints monumental history paintings that often call back to white Western traditions of painting, but updates them with themes and issues central to black culture in the United States. He'll often incorporate visual puns referring to European masterworks. In this case, his painting De Stijl, or De Stijl, he's referencing the early 20th century movement of that same name, which Mondrian was a part of. The painting, however, has very little to do with the geometric abstraction of a Mondrian, and has far more to do with style in the everyday sense. And since, this, and since you're seeing a barbershop, this pun makes a lot of sense. His figures are often of a deep black color that really pops out in relief of bright backgrounds, in this case fluorescent lights and the mirror on the, on the wall of the barbershop. This is often interpreted as a reversal of color importance in the history of Western painting, where backgrounds are often darker to give the human figures, who are predominantly lighter in skin color, a similar dynamic of popping out of the image. In this way, there's a racial hierarchy either explicitly or implicitly coded in the way Western paintings appear and are ordered by color, which Marshall both calls our attention to in this painting and his others, and subverts it by turning it on its head. Okay, so we've done a lot of work with material and visual culture in this session, and we've seen all the ways it informs our everyday lives and those in the past. In the next session, we're going to talk about another theme that's important, that has been important to nearly all human cultures, the divine. And we're going to see how various objects and artworks became mediums for spiritual and religious beliefs.